God is good. <clears throat> no, I don't know about Bob, but sometimes when I get up here, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. But I don't know what God will do with this this word that goes forth. You know, we put it out on CD, we put it out on video. We don't know where it will go. All we can do is be obedient and deliver that that He has given to us. And then it's in his hands to take it where he wants it to go. I know I say this often, but I know it to be true. He said, my word will not go out and return void. Amen. It will accomplish that, that he has purposed it to accomplish. There is a purpose. There is a reason. And all I can do is be obedient and deliver that that he's placed on my heart. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you, God. Lord, for your presence in our midst, I thank you, Lord, for your sweet, sweet touch. I pray, Father, as we look into your word, Lord, that you would deliver that, that you would have delivered. I pray that you would just take this flesh, Father, and that you would use it for your honor and for your glory, and to speak the words that you would have to be spoken. Help me, Lord, to remove myself and to keep myself out of your way so that that you would have go forth, will go forth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As those of you who were here this morning know, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6. But before I get into that, I want to say a few things. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, over the last two or three times I've preached, God has placed on my heart, uh, uh, um, I don't know if you want to call it a revelation, you can call it whatever you want, but God has shown me that in these latter days, it's going to be the small church that is going to come forth. It's going to be the small church that is going to stand up and shine. It is the small church that is going to be his witness. I don't mean small in size as far as the building's concerned. I mean, if you look around this world, you look around this country, there are a very small group of people who are totally sold out to God who are really blood bought and born again and have given themselves to God. There are a lot of big churches. There are a lot of churches that are filled to the brim, but a lot of them are not sold out to God. They're sold out to man's idea or they're sold out to the pocketbook or they're sold out to the popularity or many other things you fill in the blank. But I believe that God has shown me that in these latter days, he's going to take those few who really love him, those few who have really given themselves to him, and he is going to use them to accomplish the purpose that he wants to have accomplished in these last days. I preached a couple uh, times ago that I preached on uh, on David as the small church, how he went out and he faced Goliath. Though he was small and he looked little and though he looked like he could not accomplish anything. Amen. Because he trusted God and because he believed in God and because he went forth in the name of God, he was victorious. And I believe that the small church, the small group who are sold out to God, have to be like David. We have to go forth in confidence, in faith, in the name of our God and attack and defend and do those things that God has called us to do. I preached last week that if the small church is going to do this, if those who are born again are really going to do this, they have got to get revived. They have got to get on fire for God. They have got to get a hold of this thing and totally sell out to God. And again tonight, God has placed on my heart the small church. And when I sit and I think on this and I meditate about this, I think on this church in particular. But there are other small churches scattered about that have a small number of true believers who really believe in God. But somewhere along the line, we have sat down and we have been quiet and we have stayed in our churches. That's a little bit what I want to talk about tonight. I, I want to tell you this before we get into the, the book of Judges here. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. God has been sending message after message after message that he is ready to do something, that he is going to begin to move, that he is calling out a people. Bob talked about it right here in this circle. He believes that he is calling out a people who are willing to stand up, who are ready to stand up, who are ready to do his will, who are ready to speak for him, to go out there and do what needs to be done. And I believe he is not doing this thing in secret. He is spreading this message. He is 
is sending this message. It says that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophet. He makes these things known to his people. You can find other scriptures that are similar that go along these same lines. The point is, he will tell you what he is going to do, and he will ask you to volunteer. He won't make you do anything, but he will ask you to volunteer to step up, to step out, and to do that that he wants to have accomplished. Amen. And I believe this message tonight goes right along those same lines. This is, as you all know, this, this uh, scripture that I'm read is about Gideon. It begins with just one man. But God called him to step out. And because he was willing to step out, because he was willing to be obedient, because he did the things that were necessary to do, God used him in a mighty way. And I believe he is calling out to us here tonight and to the other small groups of people that truly love the Lord. He is calling just like he called Gideon. It's time to step out. Amen. I want to lay a little groundwork and then get into that. In Judges chapter 6 beginning at verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gala and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor eggs. Now I want to back up here and I want to look at this. These are the people of God. These are the children of God that we're talking about here. He said the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I want to submit to you that the church in the United States of America has done evil in the sight of the Lord. We have turned away from God and we are serving false God. We are serving the God of get all this money. We are serving the God of get all this popularity. We are serving the God of get big numbers. The majority of the church in this world, in this country, especially today. It's not serving the God of the Bible. They're allowing all kinds of abomination. They're allowing apostasy. They're allowing sin in the church and calling it all right. We as the church in this country have done evil in the sight of the Lord. And just like the people of God in this chapter, because we did evil in the sight of the Lord, it says the Lord delivered them in the hand of Midian. He has delivered us into the hand of our enemies. He has delivered us into the hand of the homosexual lobby. He has delivered us in the hand of the abortion lobby. He has delivered us in the hand of an evil government. He has delivered us in the hand of an evil judicial system. He has delivered us over. And because of all that, they're out there crying against the church. They're out there crying against God. They're raising a banner against God. And because of this, listen to what it said. Because of this, the children of Israel made them dens in the mountains and caves and strongholds. The church has gone in their little hole and they shut the door and they begin to hide from the world. For years now, the church has been quiet. For years now, the church has not spoke up. Years ago, when they wanted to take prayer out of the school, the church didn't make a sound. And when all these other things began to come along, the church didn't make a sound. Abortion became legal because we we're hiding in our dens and in the cave and keeping the door shut. We're big talk in here. We're all about it in here. We're going to do all kinds of things in here, but we're hiding in our cave. We have not gone out and spoken up. We have not gone out and lifted up the name of Jesus Christ. We have not gone out and shown them the power of the one and only God of the universe. We have stayed in here and kept our mouth shut just like they did. That's what we're doing. We're in the same shape they were in. We're in the same place they were in because for the same reason we have done evil in the sight of the Lord. You may say, I haven't gone out and murdered and pillaged and done drugs and all this stuff. We have not been obedient to the word of God. We have done evil in the sight of the Lord. We have allowed sin to run rampant. We have not gone into all the world and preached the gospel. We have not done what we have been called to do. We're hiding. We're scared. We're like a bunch of little rabbits. We're afraid to go out and to face them. Like David went out and faced Goliath. That's how we need to be. We need to go in the power of the God that saved our souls. Amen. Amen. 
It says they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. Why haven't we been seeing people get saved? Why aren't they coming to the altar? Why aren't people getting healed like they used to get healed? Why don't we see revival like we used to see revival? Because of what we did, that's why they stole the increase. They took everything away from us and we allowed them to do it. That's why we don't see these things happening. We let them do what they want to do. We went and hid in our home and because of that we have lost the increase. There was a time I can even remember when almost every service you would see somebody get blessed. You would see somebody come to the altar. You would see God move in some way or another. When I was growing up there were revivals where the power of God fell and you would see God move. You would see people get healed. I've seen people come into church with all kinds of ailments and come and get anointed and prayed for and God would heal and they would walk out whole. Why don't we see that anymore? I'm going to tell you why. They had destroyed the increase. And they couldn't have done it if we wouldn't have let them do it. We let them do it. We are the ones who have the power. We are the ones who are indwelt with all power. But we bottled it up. And we hid in our caves. And we hid in our holes. And we kept our mouth shut. And we didn't go out and display the power of God. It was said here that, that God would do things as he did in the early church. That we would see the power of God once again like we used to see it. But in order for that to happen, we have got to be willing to quit hiding in the hole. And quit hiding in the cave. And go out there and be like David or be like this man that we're going to read about. It says, Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. The church has been greatly impoverished because of this evil world that we live in, because of this evil government that we have, because of this evil judicial system, because of the false religions that are going on, the false Christians and the false prophets and the false doctrine that's going on. We are impoverished. But I believe that around this country, just like in this church, there are small groups that are beginning to cry out. There are small groups that are beginning to cry for God to do something, for God to move. Like it says here that they did, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. It's exactly what he's saying to the church today. I delivered you out of the hand of Satan. I delivered you out of the shackles he had on you. I delivered you from the drug. I delivered you from the alcohol. I delivered you from all those nasty things you used to do. And I set you on the right path. And I told you to obey my word and to follow what I told you to do. But you have not obeyed my voice. And that's why the church is where it is today. But I'm going to tell you something. We serve a merciful God. We serve a loving God. We serve a God who is still willing to give us another chance, just like he gave them another chance. Although they cried out, and he said, you didn't listen to me up to this point. You would not obey my voice. That's why you're in the shape that you're in now, because you would not listen to what I had to say. But even though all that had gone on, listen, he gives them another chance, and I believe he's given us one more chance, one more time, but we've got to do what this man did. We've got to follow this pattern if we're going to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. It said, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abazai, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. He was still hiding. He was still hiding. He was hiding with his weed. He was hiding so the Midianites wouldn't see him. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody here, but a lot of us are still doing that. We're hiding and presenting the word. We're hiding and praising God. We're hiding and worshiping God, just like he was doing here. But I want you to get this. God is merciful. He's coming to us anyway. He's going to give us one more chance. Just
just listen to what he said to him, and this is what he said to us. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And that's what he's saying to you tonight, church, to this church right here, to the other small churches who truly love the Lord. The Lord is with you. You are a mighty people. He didn't feel like a mighty person. He was hiding to thresh his wheat. He didn't feel like he was anything. A lot of time we don't either. Look around you. There's not very many here. We don't feel like we're very mighty. We don't feel like we're very strong. But God doesn't see the way that we see. He doesn't look with the eyes of man. He looks to what is inside of you. Like Bob talked this morning, inside of you dwells all power. Inside of you dwells the most powerful force that has ever existed. Inside of you dwells the Holy Spirit of God. And because of that, you are a mighty people. You are what he said you are. You have just got to get a hold of it. You have got to believe it. And you have got to act like it and go forth in that power and do what it is that God has set before you. Amen. Amen. He said, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And I'm saying to you sitting right here tonight, to Jefferson Church and to the other churches that are here in me, the Lord is saying unto you, the Lord is with you. He has heard your cry. He knows that you want to move. He knows that you want to feel his power. He knows you want to experience his presence. He knows that you want to accomplish something for you. And he's saying tonight, the Lord is with you. You are a mighty people in the Lord. Nothing can stop you in the Lord. You can overcome all obstacles in the Lord. You can overcome any enemy. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. That is the people you are. You are the people of God. Thank you, Lord. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. It's what we said. If he be with us, if he's really with us, why has all this befallen us? Bob talked a little bit about it this morning. I'm not going to re-preach his message. But we know why all this has befallen us. Because we have forsaken his way. We have refused to do what we have been called to do. What we're in this life to do. The only reason that we're here. To uplift the name of Jesus Christ. To present him to a lost and a dying world. To present God in a way that the lost can see him. That this world can see that there is a God. And that's why we are in the shape that we are in. That's why we haven't seen the things that I was talking about for years and years and years and years. Just like Israel didn't see the miracle because they forsook him. That's the same reason that we haven't seen them. But listen to what he said. The Lord looked on him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he's calling out to us, Go in this thy might, and you shall shall deliver them. If you go in this thy might, in that might that I've been talking about, that might that indwells you as a child of God, that power of the Holy Spirit, go in the Holy Spirit and nothing can stop you. Nothing by any means can harm you. Nothing by any means can hurt you. You've heard it for months now. Listen to what he's saying. Go in this thy might. Have not I sent thee. He is sending us. He is calling us out to go out and to do a work, to do a job for him. And it's time that we obey. It's time that we rise up and come out of our cave and come out of our dens and come out of our hole and take it out there where it's needed and present the gospel. And he says, if you go in this your way, because that he has sent you, he said, because of that, you shall save them. We can deliver many from the clutches of Satan. We can deliver many from the false religion, from the false prophet, from the false doctrine. If we will but go forth, we can deliver them in the name of God, in the name of Jesus Christ. If we go forth, we will deliver them. I know this sounds like a rehab of what I preached about David, but somebody's not getting a hold of it. You need to act on it. You need to believe it. I don't know what we're waiting for. God is just waiting for 
for you to stand up and say, here am I, send me and take a step. And when you do that, he will fill you. He will empower you. He will use you. But we have got to get a hold of it. We sit and we sit and we sit. We agree with the messages and we say amen. And we go out and we're no different than we were before we heard the message. You've got to get a hold of it. It does you no good unless you do something with it. I don't know what's stopping us. We have the access to an amazing abundance of power, to an amazing abundance of blessing. We have an access to things that I can't even explain to you. And yet we sit and we sit and we sit. We it, all we got to do is stand up and claim it as ours, as children of God. It is ours, and we can have it. We've got in that habit. We're just so used to sitting in our homes like little rabbits and letting the world go by. we got to break that habit. We've got to get a hold of it and understand this isn't bread. This is the word of God. He's telling you, take it. It's yours. I will indwell you. I will fill you. I will manifest myself through you. But you have got to get up and move. He said unto him, O my Lord, wherewithal shall I say? Behold, my family is poor in the and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites. I know we think that way. We look at ourselves the way that men look at men. We look at ourselves and say, who are we? We're a small, tiny group of people. Hey, it's been said out there, this church here ain't not been ain't gonna be around very much longer. Who are we? We are the least among the churches around here. If you don't believe us, go ask the church down there. They're the ones who said it. But that's not what God said. God has told you, you sitting here listening to me. God has told you, you are a mighty people, and I have called you, and I will go with you and if you go in my name you will smite you will save you will deliver I don't care what they said I don't care what they said all that matters is what he said and we gotta get a hold of it and believe it and claim it and go forth in power and go forth in victory and he's calling and he's calling and he's calling when are you gonna move Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talks with me. And then he listened to what he said, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come. When the Lord came and spoke to him, he asked the Lord, Don't go anywhere. I want to give you something. Don't go anywhere because I want to give you a gift. So many times when the Lord comes and we have felt him, we know he has come here and he has moved among us and he has touched us and then it's over and we go home. How many times have you cried out when he's here? Don't go anywhere. I want to give you something. I got something to give you. And then give him yourself. Give him your heart. Give him your mind. Give him your hands, your feet, your mouth, your ears, your eyes. And just give it to him as a gift. That's what we need to do. We want to take and we want to take and we want to take. We want God to come and to give me, give me, give me, give me. And don't get me wrong, I love it. When he comes and he gives us that sweet, sweet spirit, I love when he comes and we feel the spirit move amongst us or he heals one of us or he touches one of us. I love that. But it's not all about what we can get. It's time that we start giving back. It's time that we start giving him something. What have you given the Lord lately? And there are many who say, well, I go to church every Sunday. You ain't giving him nothing. You ain't doing him no favor. When you come here, you receive. He's not the one to get something out of it. You're the one who gets something out of it. Amen. It's time that we be like Gideon. And when the Lord comes on the scene, that we cry out to him, don't leave. Stay here until I can give you something. And give yourself to him totally, 100%, sold out, not just for those couple 
couple minutes while you're feeling the goosebumps, not just for those couple minutes while you're liking that song you're hearing and it's gone when you get out the door, but when you give it to him, you leave it with him. It's time that the people of God really start acting like the people of God, not the people of the church, not the people of the denomination, not the people of my little group, or whatever you want to put in there. We are to be the people of God, and you can't be the people of God unless you are given to God. Amen. Amen. He said, Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. When's the last time you came and set a gift before the Lord? I put my money in the offering plate. That's not what he's talking about. He wants you. Amen. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants your will. He wants your energy. He wants your obedience. Those are the things that he wants. And those are the things we don't want to give. Those are the things that we hold on to. We want those for ourselves. We'll crack open our wallet and throw a dollar in the plate. Yeah, we can do that. That's easy. But to totally die out to self and give ourselves to the Lord, we don't want to do that. And that's why we haven't seen the miracles. That's why we haven't seen our lost saved. That's why we haven't seen healing. That's why we haven't seen revival. Because we won't give him what is necessary to give him in order to see these things happen. Amen. He said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, an unleavened cake, some meat for a flour. The flesh he put in a basket. He put the broth in a pot and brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cake. And there rose a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened clay, cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Bob talked on this a little bit this morning. We have got to come and present our sacrifice, present our offering, lay it on that rock, that rock that is Jesus Christ. We have got to give it all to have. We have got to give him the flesh. We have got to give him the bread. What is the bread? You read the Bible. Bread is life. He wants your life. He wants your flesh. He wants your life. He don't want all your other garbage. That's why he had to dump the bread out, but it's usually the broth that we want to bring and give to him. He don't want that. He said to dump that out. Get rid of it. It has no place in the house of God. It has no place in the life of a child of God. And whatever the broth is in your life, you know what it is. God will reveal it to you. And he said you've got to get rid of something. You've got to dump out something. There are things in your life that are hindering you, that are stopping you from going out and doing what I want you to do. You need to get rid of those. And once you get rid of those, I want your life laid on the altar. I want your flesh laid on the altar. I want you to give yourself wholly to me. And when we do that, like Bob talked this morning, that fire of God will come down. It will consume that. It will consume that flesh. It will consume that man's will. It will consume all the things of the flesh that are hindering you. And it will fill you with the fire of God that will enable you to go out and to really be the people of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. The people of God are not a bunch of weak sissies. The people of God are not a bunch of scaredy cats. The people of God are not a bunch of wimps and a bunch of powerless somebody. The real people of God are endued with power from on high and nothing by no means can hurt them. Nothing can stand before them when they go in the power of the Spirit, in the name of God, in the name of Christ. Nothing can stop them. Nothing can slow them down. Nothing can shut them up. That's the people of God. When's the last time you saw a church acting like that? Well, it's time that we do that. We have cried out and we have sought God to move. 
we have asked God to do something and he has heard us and he's given us a chance and what is he saying go in that strength that I have filled you with I will go with you and you will see you will smite you will conquer you will be victorious but then he goes on here what had to happen before he even went out he had to go and lay himself on the altar and be willing to give up something and be willing to let go of something and give all the rest to God. Amen. That's got to happen. We have got to be purged. We have got too much of the world in us. We've got too much of the flesh in us. We've let it come into church. We've let it come into our lives, and we're okay with it. We've made so many excuses over the years that it's become acceptable. It's time we dump it out. It's time we get rid of it. It's time that we lay everything on the altar and let him consume the chaff that is in our lives that is no good and purify everything that is left and use it for his honor and for his glory to accomplish his purpose. And there arose a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. That's what I want in my life. And I can have it. And you can have it. All you got to do is go lay yourself on that rock. That rock that is Christ. You know, there's scripture that says, if any man falls on this rock, that he will be broken of his self, of his own flesh, of his spirit, of his will, and be filled with that of God. But if that rock falls on any man, he will be ground Amen. to dust. Amen. I'd rather fall on the rock Amen. and receive the good things than have the rock fall on me and annihilate me. Amen. It's our choice. And I know I say this a lot, and I've already said it here. God has been sending message after message after message after message. When are we going to grab it? When are we going to get a hold of it? When are we going to rise up in power and begin to march forth in the power of the Holy Spirit? We're just not getting it. We hear the words, but we're not moving. We're not taking action. We're not doing anything. And I'm not, by saying taking action, I'm not telling you to go down here and march around the circle in Jefferson and preach. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you to take action in your life. That's where it has to begin. You have got to cry out to God to purge you, to clean you, to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a scary thing to people anymore. They don't want to be filled with the Spirit. You might act a little funny. You might act a little crazy. You might do something that the rest of the church world doesn't approve of. But that is the power of God. God, and that is what we need if we're going to accomplish the will of our Father. We cannot do it in ourselves. We must be filled with the Spirit. That is the only place to get the power, and that's where it's got to start, by purging off the old stuff, being filled with the power of God, and surrendering everything to Him. That's what I'm talking about when I say we need to take action. I, I can't remember how many times over the past few months that God has sent a message offering the Holy Holy Spirit to those who would have, to those who would desire it, to those who would receive it, and nobody moves, nobody wants it, nobody acts on it. I don't know this, God's not telling me this, but I have a fear. He's going to withdraw the offer if we don't soon take him up on it. We better heed while we can heed, while we can get it, we better get it. Amen. Goes on and says, Jump down to verse 24. Guilty and build an altar there unto the Lord and call it Jehovah Shalom. He already gave his offering. He laid everything he had on that altar. He presented the flesh. He presented the bread. He dumped out the stuff that was no good, that wasn't acceptable. He got rid of all that. That wasn't enough. Then he built an altar, a place where he can meet God, a place where he could speak with God, a place where he could commune with God, a place where he could hear from God. Where is our altar? We got five minutes here on Sunday morning, maybe. A couple minutes when we lay down until we fall asleep we might mumble now nah, lay me down to sleep or something we need to be in communication with God we need to have an order in our life a real order like they had 
where they could come and they knew that God would meet them there. They knew that God would hear them. They knew that they could hear from him. We need that. We've taken the order out of our life. It's sad. We mumble a couple of minute prayer and think we've done something. We need to commune with God. We need to be in communication with God. Even after he had took and gave that offering, that prize, that, that, that gift that he wanted to give God, even after that, the next thing he did, he went and built an altar, which means he wanted to be in communication with God. He didn't want anything clogging the line. He wanted to hear clearly the instructions that were coming from God. And if he had a question or he needed to say something to God, he wanted to know that he had that connection. And we need to have that. We've let so much stuff come in that we clog up the line, that there's no uh, getting any messages through. We can't hear God when he speaks because we got too much other stuff in the way. Goes on, it says, and it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this, this rock, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, and offer a burnt sacrifice, and with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. I want you to get there. He gave a gift. He laid in the gift. He took and laid his gift on the rock. He took his gift to Christ and laid it at his feet. And the Lord accepted that gift. That wasn't even enough. He went and he built an altar so that he communed with God. And then what happened right after that? The Lord came to him and said, Go tear down the altar of Baal. You get everything that is of this world. You get everything that is not of God out of your life. You take and you tear it down. You destroy it. You destroy it. You have nothing more to do with it. And it, you, I think we need to stop and examine ourselves because as I said, we have let things creep in and we're at a point now that a lot of us don't realize that some of the things we're doing, some of the things we're watching, some of the things we have are not godly things and we should not have them. We need to clean up our lives. We need to clean out our lives. And once we do that, we need to do what he said here. After we throw down all those things, get rid of all those things of Satan, all those things of Baal, what did he say do then? Build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock. After we clean ourselves out, after we get rid of all that stuff, we need to build an altar. And that altar needs to be founded on the Lord Jesus Christ and on nothing else at all. Only him. Nothing else. Not the church. Not the denomination. Not the pastor. Not the theologian. Not the TV minister. Not a set of DVDs. Not a set of books. On the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we have got to be built. That's where we have got to be founded. That's where we have got to be grounded. We have got to build on that rock. He said on the top of this rock, in the ordered place. There is an order that has to be met. There is an order that God has laid out. And I believe that what he's telling me to tell you tonight, this is the order that the church needs to follow. We have got to do like Gideon did here. We have got to go in the power of God, clean ourselves out, get rid of the things that are no good, present everything else to God so that we are sanctified and made fit for the master's use. And then we have got to go in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the order that it's got to go in. You can't come in and be all filthy and dirty and have things of the world in your life and expect God to fill you and empower you and to use you. You have got to go in order. You have got to get cleaned out and get cleaned up and present yourself to him in order for him to fill you. Build an order upon the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. We have got to be built on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, I preached a while back on some of this stuff but God has brought it to my mind again. You know what? This is not a decoration. This is 
not a piece of furniture. This is a holy place. This is set aside for God. You go back and you read in the Bible. What was the order for? It was to come and present my sacrifice of thanksgiving. It was to come and to present my sacrifice of praise. It was come to present the sin sacrifice. Whatever I had to give to God, I was to bring to the altar. I'm not saying you got to wait till Sunday and come up to this piece of wood right here. But I'm saying we need a dedication to that kind of an idea, to that place where and give them to God and offer them up to God. We need a place where we meet God and that place in your life today, in this world today, in the church today, that place is in your heart. That's where you need to meet God. That's where you need to come in contact with Him. But so many of us got heart blockage. We need an open heart surgery to remove a lot of that stuff out of there. And maybe some of us need that old stony heart busted up and replaced with a heart of flat so that we can meet him. Amen. The altar is a very important thing, but we've left it out of our lives. We've just discarded it. We think we can say, I already touched on this, I'm going to try to keep moving on. But we think we can just mumble a little two-second prayer and everything's good. They had to put forth some effort. They had to put forth something in order to come and meet with God. They had to give something. They had to sacrifice something. They had to take their best animal or whatever other thing they want and give it up to God. We're not willing to give anything up. Sometimes all he wants is a little bit of your time and we're not willing to give that up. Uh, maybe he's calling out. Just come and talk with me for a half an hour. That's all I'm asking. We can't give him half a minute. We can't give him anything. We don't want to sacrifice nothing. And that's what we need to do in order to show him that we mean business. I had a lot more, but God's taking me somewhere else. We all know, if you go into chapter 7, we all know this account, and I'm not going to read all of it. But what happened was Gideon got there. He heard what the Lord said. He believed God. He went out in the power of God. He followed God's direction. It says that uh, Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod. And there was a whole bunch of them because Gideon had gone out and he had done what God had said. It says back there that he blew a trumpet and people began to gather unto him. That's the first thing we got to do once we get to that point that he was out. After we get sanctified, after we get cleaned up, after we get filled with the power, we have got to blow the trumpet. We have got to sound forth the call. If the watchman who is on the wall sees the enemy coming and he don't blow the trumpet, then the whole city is going to lie away. We are the watchmen. We need to sound the trumpet. When he sounded the trumpet, they began to come in. A lot of them came in. And I don't, again, I don't want to get too much into Bob's message, but as he told you this morning, he ended up with 32,000 of them. But most of them weren't sincere. Most of them weren't really willing to do what God had called them. And that's what's going to happen. But for those that were sincere, those who meant business, God took that little group of people, and it's a very tiny, minute group compared to all the thousands that they were going up against. It was a very minute group. God took them and he used them, and that's exactly what he wants to do with us. With you sitting right here, with you hearing my voice, if you mean business with God, it's not about your numbers. It's not about how big you are, and I know I say this a lot because God burns it on my heart. It's about how big your God is. That's the only thing that matters. And he will take you and he will use you if you are willing to be you. If you will go forth in his power, in his spirit, following his direction, then he will use you. Amen. Verse 3 of chapter 7. Now therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people. Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return. And that's what's going to happen. People are going to come. Some come out of curiosity. Some come to point fingers and laugh. Some come for some other reason. But God will call out the ones that he can use, the ones that he has chosen. And we've heard this over the past couple weeks. He's sending them to us. He's calling them in. They're on their way. People are going to come. I know in my heart, I know in my spirit that they are coming. 
He's going to get the ones that he wants. And when we get them together, we have got to be prepared to battle. When he got them together, that little group that God wanted to use, they didn't fall around. They didn't waste no time. They went forward and did as God called them to do. Amen. Amen. And we've got to be ready. And we can't be ready unless we do what Gideon did. When they come, you are the Gideon. They are the 300 that are coming. Gideon was the leader. Gideon was the one who was getting the direction from God. Gideon was the one that God chose. We are the ones he has chosen. He is going to send them to us. But we have got to be able to lead them. And we can't lead them unless we get to that point that Gideon was at. If Gideon hadn't have done all the things that God told him to do, he would have been worthless. He would have been useless. He would have had a whole bunch of people but they would have accomplished nothing Amen. and you can see that all over this country there's church after church after church stacked to the rafters with people what are they doing making each other feel good that's about it Amen. they go in and get a pep talk on Sunday they go in and get a motivational speech on Sunday or they're told how if they send money they can get more money but they're accomplishing nothing for God we have got to get to that place that Gideon was at. I'm talking to the members of this church and in particular. We have got to get to that place that Gideon was at. We have got to take and present our gift to the Lord. We have got to take and lay our sacrifices out to the Lord. We have got to be willing to get rid of the things that are of no use. And we have got to be willing to stand up in the power of God, in the might of God, and to go forth as Gideon went forth. Well, Gideon got a sign. God made it wet on the fleece and dry on the ground. God made it dry on the fleece and wet on the ground. So he knew it was God. How do we know it's not just you and Bob talking? That Holy Spirit that dwells within you is pricking your heart, and you know there is something to what is being said here. You know that God wants to do a work. You know that God wants to move. You know that God wants to save the lost, that he wants to heal the sick. He wants to set the captive free. You know, if you're born again and that Holy Spirit indwells you, you know that God is called. You can put it off on something else if you want to so that you give yourself an excuse to ignore it and not have to do anything. But you're going to have to stand before God one day and answer for why you did that. That's between you and God. Gideon got a sign. I believe we have gotten a sign too. I believe God has just shown us too many things for us to doubt. He has moved in our midst. He has spoken to our hearts. He has sent message after message after message. He said, Bob talked about it, and I'm not going to go back into that message he preached either. But God is sending a whole bunch of people right down the road here. He's bringing them to us. You go back and listen to that message and let God fire you up again. They are coming, and we have got to be ready. We have got to be the Gideon to their 300. They need a leader. They need someone to guide them. They need someone to direct them in battle, to show them how to fight the battle. Amen. When we go in our own, using our own thoughts and using our own mind and using our own ingenuity, we would mess it all up. If Gideon would have done what he thought probably should have been done, he would have probably took spears and swords and shields, and that 300 would have got wiped out. If he would have went in his power, using his ingenuity. But what did God tell him? Take a pitcher and a torch and a trumpet. Now who goes into battle with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people with that? Those who are obedient to God. That's who. Amen. He will give us the weapons. Sure. He will give us direction on what to use and how to use them. But we've got to be at a point where we can take direction, where we can hear direction, where we can follow direction. Over in verse 7, chapter 22, And the 300 blew the trumpet. And the Lord sent every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zerath, and to the border of Babylon the law, or something like that, and <laughs> to Beth. They did what God said. They blew the trumpet. And I keep coming back to this because God keeps saying it to me. 
That trumpet is that warning cry. That trumpet is what the watchman is to blow. That trumpet is what we are to be sounding out. And, and again, Bob touched on it, and I'm not going to go back through it, but it's that light that is within you, and that warning sound, that cry that we put out there, that will enable the lost to see their way to God, that will enable the hurting, the sick, the captive, to find their way to God. I want you to really listen to what he said there. When they did that, what happened? The Lord set every man's sword against this man. The Lord did it. All they had to do was be obedient, and God did the work. All they had to do was what he said, and he did the work. And that's all he's asking of us. Just be obedient. Just do what I tell you, and I'll do the work. I'll make sure it happens. But you've got to follow my direction. You've got to be obedient to what I say. You just do what I tell you, nothing more, nothing less, and I'll handle the rest. And that's what he's saying to us, just like he did to them. He will do the work. If we do our part, if we show him we are obedient, if we show him we are willing, but they didn't even have to touch them people. They didn't even have to put their life in danger. They didn't have to go into the enemy camp. They didn't have to draw a sword or have one drawn on them. All they had to do was stand there, shine the light, and blow the trumpet. That's all they had to do. That's all he's asking of us. Shine the light. Sound the trumpet. I'll do the rest. I'll do the heart. and shine that light and I'll take care of it. Amen. That's all he's asking of us. We got the easy part. We got the easy job. And he will even prepare you for it. You don't got to do it. He will prepare you. All you got to do, here am I. Amen. Lay yourself on that rock. Present yourself to him. Let him clean you, purge you cleanse you, sanctify you, get rid of all the stuff that's unusable and raise you up and you can go forth in the power of God. You can go out there and surround that evil world. You can surround that sinful world and you can shine that light and sound that trumpet and then God will move. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. He never once said, you should go out and drag them to me. He never said, you should go out and coerce them to come to me. You should act have activities so that they'll come in. You should play bingo, sell subs, uh, have Foss Knots on Foss Knot Day. You should do all these other things so that they'll come unto me. What he said to you was, if I be lifted up, I will draw them unto me. We don't need anything else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need anything else other than this gospel. And if we do it the way he said to do it, and we sound the trumpet and shine the light, he will bring them in. That's been the problem in the church for too long. We think we can get them with gimmicks. We think we can get them with activity. We think we can get them by putting on shows and having concerts and going on trips and doing all these other things. I'm going to tell you something. If you can show it to me in here, I will do it. saying bus trips and stuff is wrong but that's not how you win people to the Lord if you win them with gimmicks you're going to get what you have advertised for yeah. right. what happens when the gimmicks are gone what happens when the activity is over what happens when the false knots are all eat up they're gone but if you give them Jesus Amen. he lasts he will never leave them he will never forsake them he is always satisfying. He is that bread of life. He will fill them. He is that water of life. He will quench their thirst. Activities and stuff might work for an hour a day a week. Jesus lasts forever. Amen. He meets every need, every longing, Amen. every desire. Amen. He fulfills it all. Thank you, Lord. And that's what he's calling us to do. That's all. That's all. It's not a hard thing. I don't know what happened to us. Why are we so scared? What happened to the church? Exactly what happened to Israel. We let them bully us. We let them cajole us. We've been delivered in the hands of a sinful nation, of sinful government, a sinful judicial system. All the things that are going on, you know all about it. And we've gotten scared of them and crawled in our home. 
We're the ones with the power. We're the ones with God. We are the ones who are the children of the Almighty. And we're the ones hiding in our holes. Something wrong. We need to rise up. We need to stand up. We need to be a Gideon. We need to be a David. We need to go in the power of God. And that's all he's asking us to do. Step out. Shine the light. Sound the trumpet. That's it. That's all he's asking you to do. He's not asking anything difficult. He's not asking you to lay down your life. He, he, just stand up. That's all. Speak out. That's it. I know I keep repeating myself, but God keeps burning it on my heart. We're not getting it. Somebody's not getting it, or these messages wouldn't keep coming. I don't know if somebody here, somebody's going to see or hear this or whatever. But you need to understand, you can be filled with power. You can be energized. You can be like the church was in the book of Acts. You can have the very same thing they had. You can go forward in the demonstration of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. You can lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You can preach the gospel, every one of you. You don't got to be ordained. You don't got to be a called minister. All you got to do is be filled with the Spirit and open your mouth and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these things are ours, and we've allowed them to take the increase. We've allowed them to take it from us. It's time that we get up and we go out and take our fields back. Those are our fields. God had gave them to us. He said they're white on the harvest. Now get out there and begin to harvest them. That's what we're called to. That's what we need to do. Thank you, Lord. Rise up. He goes on and he said, The Lord sent every man's sword against his fellow throughout all the host, and they took off. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters under Bethbarah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters under Bethbarah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. And Zeeb they slew at the winepress of Zeeb, and pursued Midian. And brought the heads of Horeb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. I want you to get that. After God did the work, after God put them on the run, then all the men of Israel, and Naphtali, and Manasseh, and Asher, they all came to get in on a bend. When we step out there in the power of God, and God begins to move, and people begin to see what our God can do, and who our God is, then they're going to start coming. Then they're going to start coming out of the hill, just like they did there. That 300 were obedient to God. God put the enemy on the run. And when the rest of Israel saw that, they wanted to get in on it. And that's what's going to happen. If we rise up as a Gideon, if we go out there and do what God has told us to do, and we begin to put the enemy on the run, that he talked about those princes that they took after, and we know that we battle against principalities and against power and against the rulers of wickedness in high places, we can go out and we can pull down some of those princes, some of those princes of wickedness that are ruling over a lot of the things in our country, and when God begins to move and to do those things and people see God for who he is, they're going to begin to come and get in on it and we can reach the law and we can help the hurting, we can set the captive free, but we've got to start where Gideon started. Amen. Get out of your hole. That's the first thing. You got to believe God. When he came unto him and presented what he presented to Gideon, Gideon accepted it, he believed it, and he began to move on it. He got up from behind that wine press where he was hiding it and thrashing his wheat. He got up out of there. That's the first move. It's time that we get up out of that place where we're at. Get out of those doldrums. Get out of that fear. Get out of that complacency. Get out of that lukewarmness. We need to rise up. We need to stand up. We need to come and get what it is that he has for us. Get up out of that place. Come and put it all on the altar. Let God do the work that only God can do. And that's what Gideon had to do. Got up from behind that wine press. And then he 
went and he made the offering. He made the sacrifice. He laid everything on that rock and God accepted that and God consumed what was not usable and filled him with what he needed to fill him with and sent him out. And each and every one of you that's hearing me, that is available to you right now. Whatever it is that's stopping you, whatever it is that's holding you down, it, it might be fear, it, it might be laziness, it might be lukewarmness, it might be self-satisfaction. I don't know what it is, but you need to get out of that hole. You need to rise up. God is calling. He has come and he has said, stand up, thou mighty people, stand up, thou people of valor, and come and do the job that God has for you. And now is the time to rise up and come and lay it on the altar and let God do what only God can do and make you what only God can make you and use you. Only the choice, it is up to you. I had a lot more, but God said that's enough. I'm going to stop. I just want to reiterate this, and then I'll be done. I've said that so many times after the end of a message. God is calling. He's calling, and he's calling, and he's calling, and we're not moving. And I am not trying to speak for God. I'm not saying I'm prophesying. I'm not saying I know anything, but I am scared that there's going to come a time, a point where he stops calling. And it's going to be too late. He's been offering and offering and calling and calling. And we're not moving. We're not acting. And you can sit and you say, I, I hear you. And I'm being a better person. And I'm doing all this. It's time for it to show. It's time that when we look at one another, we see the power of God. We see the glory of God. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not pointing fingers at nobody. I'm just telling you what God is telling me and what I see with my own eyes. I see no difference in a lot of people. I, even after God has sent these messages, calling out and offering things to people, wanting to fill people, wanting to get people things, wanting people to use the gifts that he has given them. I am seeing any difference. Nothing is changing in your life. Nothing is changing that anybody can get a hold of that's going to make any kind of difference. What is the point of coming and hearing the message that God has if you're not going to do anything with it? I'm going to tell you something. It's just one more thing that you're going to have to answer for when you stand before God. Every message you hear, every time he calls out, every time he cries out to you, every time he offers you something and you reject it, when you stand before God, you are going to have to answer for that. And you aren't going to have any excuses. God wants you to have it. The only thing that I can figure is you don't want it. It's time to quit playing games. If you don't want it, why do all this? Why go through all this? Why keep coming and hearing and listening and saying amen and nod your head and agreeing and sitting there and leaving the same as you were when you come in? God don't send these messages just so I can make a video, so I can make a CD, so that he can hear me talk. He sends the message to who he knows is going to hear it. He knew you would hear it. He sent it to you. He's calling out to each and every one of us. And I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm not all that I should be. I'm not all that I can be. There are things that I can move up on. There are things that I can change. There are things that I want to do more. But for whatever reason within myself, I haven't done and God has convicted me tonight, and I've got to lay that down, and I've got to give it to God, and I'm going to this altar. But I, my heart is heavy. My heart hurts because people will not get a hold of it. I, I don't know how to make it any plainer. God wants to fill you. Don't you want to fill? Don't you want that presence of the Holy Spirit in such a way that you can't contain it? It can be yours. It's yours if you want it. God has offered it. All you got to do is take him up on the offer. I know I probably quoted this every time I preached for the last month. If you know how to give your children good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who want it, who ask for it, who desire it? He wants you to have it. 
But you gotta move. You gotta take him up on the offer. I'm done. That, that's all that I have. I, I've got to get on the altar. If you want to come and pray, you come and pray. If you want to leave me here, you do that. Whatever you feel you need to do.